Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes a pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by Delaware. It's fact. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Episode 73 of the Last Round Podcast. Unfortunately, no Danny Z again today due to the social distancing rules out here in California. We want to keep ourselves away from each other. But I have a special guest, the vice president and matchmaker of Golden Boy Promotions, Roberto Diaz. Hey, Michael. Hi. How are you? Thanks for having me. And of course, we send Danny all the best. And crazy times, crazy times out here in California. I've never spent so much time at home watching old fights and, uh, you know, just sat on the sofa getting fat, really. Well, you know, it it is unfamiliar territory for all of us. Um, but like like a like a 12 round fight, you know, um, it's not over. And we just got to we just got to roll with the punches and, and, you know, hope to get back to normal, back to our routine as soon as possible. Exactly, exactly. So, obviously, this episode was going to be all about your career in boxing. So, let's you know start from the beginning. You have kind of have a fascinating story of how you actually got into boxing through uh, one of your favorite fighters, Marco Antonio Barrera. Yes, it's it's a very uh, how do you say very uh, dream come true, very surreal type of story because I've always been fascinated through bo- of boxing. Grew up watching boxing. Uh, my dad would take me to the fights when I was young. Um, and then, you know, the love began as a, as a young kid, but years, it was right after the, his loss to junior Jones, like the second fight, I bump into him at a mall in San Diego during the Christmas season shopping. <laughs> and as a big fan of Barreras, I had never met him before. I, I approached him like all fans, you know, for, uh, maybe words of encouragement and keep your head up and you'll be back. And, and, you're still young and I'm a big fan. The relationship began and, and, you know, it went on for years. It went on for years that through time I ended up, you know, carrying his flag in the first couple fights. And eventually uh, when he moved on to another promoter, golden boy promotions, um, we we'll started advising and, and working his fights with Eric Gomez and, and everybody at golden boy. So it, it was, to this day, I mean, there's times I wake up and, you know, today working for Golden Boy Promotions is, is it's, it's funny because it's like, wow, you know, it was a dream come true. I, at times as a young kid watching fights, sneaking into press conferences, uh, today running and doing press conferences and working with some of the best athletes. It's been very, very fortunate. I mean, it, it, I'm very grateful to boxing. Uh, you, you were a part of the team for the uh, Prince Nazim Hamid fight. Can you just describe to us how big that was for the team? And, you know, that was a, would you say that was a defining fight for Marco Antonio? You know, um, outside of, I think, 90% of the world in the boxing experts, media writers, fans, who who rightfully so had Hamid as a favorite, Marco, the moment that fight got signed, was very confident i remember him telling me after the first initial press conference uh we're in a room at the hotel and he told me this is the fight that i've been craving this is the fight that i've been dying for um this is the fight that's gonna make me and and i could see just how convinced he was that he wasn't gonna lose and of course during camp it was It was a tough camp. It was one of those from the Rocky movie. I mean, we were up in Big Bear, probably an hour and a half distance from Nazim, who was in Palm Springs. But the camps, obviously, we didn't know what was going on in his camp. But when we saw later, you know, the documentary and everything, you could see the difference. I mean, one was living like the prince (laughs) and one was living in, in, you know, three foot, four feet of snow and, and almost got run over by a car once running on the road. Cause he couldn't run in the snow <laughs> on the trails. And it was a Rocky movie, but he put in so much that that night 
it didn't matter who was in front of him. And he fought very disciplined, fought very disciplined throughout the whole, uh, you know, promotion of the fight. They asked him, how are you going to fight Hamed? He said, like I always do, I'm going to go straight at him, very aggressive. Yet he came out very, uh, very disciplined, boxing, sticking to a jab, sticking to a game plan that had been set up for weeks in camp because he knew that if he went forward and just looked for a knockout, that's where Nazim was more dangerous and, and could catch you. I mean, Nazim had tremendous power in both hands, so he, he had to fight a very disciplined fight. Can you set the record straight for us? Why was there a huge delay in the ring walk? I'm sorry? Can you set the record straight for us? Why was there a huge delay in the ring walk? Was it the gloves wouldn't fit? Or? Well, there was a lot of issues in the gloves. There was a lot of issues in, in Nazim's uh, locker room putting on the gloves. And I believe he had to put them on two or three times because he wasn't comfortable. He wasn't comfortable. In fact, you watch the videos, uh, Jorge Barrera, Marco's older brother, was in the locker room as a witness when they were rapping and they were giving Jorge a hard time. They would put the back to him. They weren't, they weren't comfortable. There was something, obviously you, you see scenes now and it's funny because, you know, Marco was always known as like a, the baby face was his nickname, but he always had a poker face. And when you go into that video and watch moments before there's Marco and the team in the locker room and Marco's laughing. He was very relaxed, very calm, and very confident of himself. In fact, at the weigh-in, we saw confidence, and we saw somewhat of a, a a reaction of Ahmed of like, holy crap, this is not the guy that I, I remember, you know, because they had fought on a couple cards, they knew each other. But Marco's body at the weigh-in, you see a change. He went from 122 to 26, and those extra four pounds really did him well. And there was also rumors of, uh, was it Vaseline on the top rope so Nazim couldn't do his usual flip into the ring? And well, that, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. And there was also rumors of Vaseline on the top rope so Nazim couldn't do his usual flip into the ring? That, that, that was, yeah, that, there, we heard that after as well, <laughs> that there was Vaseline from the fight prior, this and that, and it was like, well, really? Uh, but we just, you know, they threw beer at him. Um I, I just think all all just things weren't lined up for him that day. And then he had a fighter that was very disciplined, very talented, and that night wasn't going to lose. I mean, you could hear the crowd, obviously, the British fans, Nassim fans were very loud from the first couple rounds. But as the rounds went by, you could hear a little bit of the Mexican fans getting that motivation and encouragement and start, you know, by the end of the fight, it was the 20% Mexican fans that were there for Barrera got very loud. So the friendship... And, and, and I got to say, the Irish fans that were there for Barrera, because there was, a, there was a group of Irish fans that were out there as well supporting Barrera, which surprised us. <laughs> so how did this all translate for you eventually working for Golden Boy? You know, through the years when Marco went over as a fighter and partnered with Oscar at Golden Boy, um, just working with Golden Boy... Uh, during his fights and, and and working there, building a relationship with Eric Gomez and Oscar and everybody there at the office. It eventually, when Marco, you know, decided to retire and 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 move on, they called me one day. I got I was in South Africa for another fight, and my wife called me and said, "Hey, Eric Gomez is looking for you." <laughs> I said, "Patch us in, do a three way call." I had no idea. I had no idea what the call was. I said, maybe he's looking for a, t a fight I can help him with for an opponent or so. And he called me and said, would you be interested in working at Golden Boy? And I said, in, in doing what? And he said, matchmaking. You know, the company's growing. I'm the matchmaker, but you could help me. You can assist me matchmaking and, and maybe signing new talent. And I said, yes, yes. Uh, Event, you know, I, I couldn't, I said, let me get back to you. I'm sorry. I said, let me get back to you. And I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. I blamed that on the jet lag in South Africa, but I got <laughs> home and it was to move to LA. And, uh, I told my wife, let's go. We went uh, for a week on vacation to Mexico. And she said, I'll support you, whatever, you know, whatever you think. And I said, I just don't know what they expect or what, what, you know, nine to five. I'm not used to it. I came out to LA for eight months. And it's been 12 years, 12 great years. Did you have any matchmaking experience before that? I had matchmaking experience very little. 
from from being with Barrera because he had a few fighters coming up, we, you know, and then putting them on cards here and there. And also based on Barrera's career, um, when I got involved and started, you know, matching up with Golden Boy, the fights, that was my experience. But as a lot of fans growing up, I mean, some of these fans out there, and, and that's the message. That's the message, too, that I want to give, Michael, is you know, believe dreams do come true and I'm living proof of it. Uh, I, like I said, I, this is still a dream. I wake up at times saying, I can't believe it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this fight. I'm working on that fight, working with Bernard Hopkins, Canelo Alvarez, Virgil Ortiz, all the young talent, the Ryan Garcia's, or Linares, all these kids from all over the world, making their dreams come true, helping their dreams come true. Um, but the, the, at the end of the day, it's like, they really do happen. I mean, you know, when he called me, I said, I'll try it. I came out to LA for without my family. Cause again, I didn't know if it was going to work. And after eight months, I called my wife and said, Hey, it's, I'm staying here. It's, it's, I, I, I like what I'm doing. Um, and it was, trust me. I mean, if, if it was basically day one, it was like, okay, here's the keys. And you know, you're driving. Um, and with Golden Boy, with the amount of shows, especially uh, at the beginning, you know, with all the dates, it was like, you're either going to sink or swim right there. So you're going to learn and, and it's going to be a crash course. And it was tough. I won't say it's been an easy road. It was tough. I mean, uh, from from all the positives, there were some negatives and it was like, wow, you know, uh, in the boxing industry, it's a small circle. A, a lot of people who I thought were friends were were hating. <laughs> hey, why, you know, if he's never been a matchmaker, because there was several, several matchmakers lined up to take the position. I was fortunate. Again, it, it was, uh, you know, good luck and good relationship with the people I had worked with during the time with, I was with Barrera, and that opened the door. Can you still remember the first big fight that you matched? Yes, yes. I started... Uh, I started uh, employment with Golden Boy in October, um, November, right when Ricky Hatton was in camp. I was in Manchester with him getting ready for the Mayweather fight. But I actually started in the office in January. And Eric comes to me and says, hey, we lost uh, the co-main event on a Telefutura show. Can you make, the, can you make a fight? Just make an eight-round fight, and then here's the budget. So I started like, okay, how do I, you know, this is January and the fight's in February. And how do I start? Where do I start? And what do I do? And I made a fight that was an eight round co-main event on TV. It was Jeffrey Resto against a kid from Tijuana, uh, Tapia. And I was nervous. I was nervous because, uh, you know, is it going to be a first round blowout? Is it going to be a boring fight? Is it going to be, it was, and I, Thank both of them. Tapia has since passed. I thank both of them because they made me look great. I mean, they was a great fight. It made headlines. There was an article saying this was matchmaking is all about. So I was very lucky. I was very lucky. And what did what was it you looked at? Obviously, going into the matchmaking, obviously it depends on the person. Do you look for like a hard fight? Do you look at the clash of the styles? What is it exactly that you look at when you go to match a fight? In in that particular fight. And the budget that I had, it was two sides that had been calling me for an opportunity for a long time. Hmm. Even before I had started working at Golden Boy, hey, if there's any fights you can help me with, uh, let me know. Jeffrey Resto against Humberto Tapia. And always the Mexican and Puerto Rican have always had a great rivalry. And, and this was no exception. It was a kid from uh, East Coast, Jeffrey Resto, Puerto Rican descent against Tijuana's Humberto Tapia. And it was basically, you didn't need the third man in the ring. It was a very clean toe-to-toe -to -toe action. It went the distance. I think it was a split decision in favor of Resto. As a matchmaker, what's your opinion on, you know, those common phrases that you hear of, you know, letting fights marinate or, you know, people saying like Terrence Crawford's on the wrong side of the street? Well, I mean, some of the, the ones that always stick to me is, you know, uh, boxing is a jealous sport. Um, if you don't give it its time and meaning in, in training and camp, um, it'll get back at you. And and how many champions 
very talented or not champions, very talented fighters learn that the hard way. And they don't get up. They don't do the road work. They don't train as hard. No, and I, I don't need to train. This guy in front of me is no big deal. You know, overconfidence gets in and the other kid's been running, doing that extra mile, during that extra hour of training, doing whatever is necessary. And and I try to send that message to to our fighters that talent not always comes out on top, but hard work and hard, proper training can beat talent if that talent's not working hard. What was it like for you as the matchmaker, the journey, you know, leading Randy Caballero and also now, you know, Jojo Diaz to world titles? You know, that's been, I think, through all the sleepless nights and getting calls when fighters are pulling out uh, days before and, and after going through all those frustrations and bumps on the road, at the end of the day, those are the moments that make it all worth it. When I saw, and in both cases, you see it, father and son hugging each other and knowing we did it, that's, that fulfills you right there. Once they become that champion, it's like, you're like, wow, I was a part of this. With Randy Caballero, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing because a year before he got the title fight, we got a call from the WBO where he was, he could fight Camela for the world title. So I called the father who was the manager and I said, Hey, we got an offer. Let me know what you, if you want to take. It. And he asked me, he got really nervous as father. And he's always trusted me. He said, Robert, what do you think? And that's a tough, that's really a tough question to answer because what is the right, you know, answer uh, as a promoter? Take the fight. It's a world title fight. But I've always been more than that with a lot of uh, my relationship with a lot of the teams and fighters or managers and fighters, trainers, fathers has been a little bit closer than just that. And I said, well, Marcos, if you're asking me for my personal opinion, no, he's not ready. But if you need the money, I mean, this is a big jump in pay. And his dad said, I don't care about the money. I want my son to be a world champion. I said, okay, if that's the case, then he's not ready. But what happens if he loses the next fight? Mm -hmm. They could always blame you and say, you said he wasn't ready. And now look. So he asked me, why is he not ready? I said, he's only fought in California. This fight is in Japan. First time out of the States. First time for a world title. Against a tough opponent. I don't like it. So the very, very next fight, we went to Florida and he fought a Cuban kid. I wanted to see how Randy reacted outside of his environment. And he looked better than ever. He had a lot of pressure fighting at home. And that day he looked really good, knocked out the opponent. We got a, a title eliminator with another organization for the IBF. And now we had to go to Japan to fight somebody. And he said, well, you told me not to go to Japan. I said, well, he's ready now. And he won by knockout, and that led to the fighting uh, Stewart for the world title in Monaco. So he 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 did it the tough way. He had to go on the road for two fights, and it was just very satisfying. I mean, I, I it was very tough against Stewart. Stewart fought a very good fight, and when we got the decision, I saw them embrace father and son, and and me, I mean, it it's just one of the greatest moments. And now, just recently. With Jojo Diaz and his father, I mean, his father learned boxing through books and YouTube, and and to work with a you know, with Jojo to make the Olympic team from an Olympian go on and fight for the world title now you know two three times in in a short career and that become world champion. I mean, though that's what makes the sleepless nights, the tough calls, fights falling, uh, all worth you know it makes it all worth it because. When you see those dreams come true and you change lives. I also believe you took, uh, was it Pauli Malinaji out to the Ukraine for a very tough fight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a, that was, I mean, that's, you know, whenever I see Pauli, we embrace and that was a lot of the behind the scenes on that fight would make you laugh and cry. And, and it was just hilarious. We, we, we go out to Ukraine 
And first of all, he's fighting an undefeated world champion who's much bigger, uh, physically bigger, stronger. Polly's not a puncher. But from day one, it was just, you know, uh, just crazy because we get there and there was changes and, 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 you know, the officials and uh, you couldn't use it. And we were not aware in Europe, you know, that you get the adrenaline at the ringside from the doctor, the commission doctor. But we had our adrenaline and not that we didn't trust, but it's like, how do I know this is adrenaline? How do I know? And and it was like, well, here, you can use the champions. Well, how do I know you didn't switch it on them? You originally. <laughs> so we got the supervisor look over his bottle from his cut, man, and it was sealed. And okay, yes, you, you it's approved. And there was glove issues and all kinds of little things started coming up uh, prior to the fight. And I kept telling him, don't worry, don't worry. Look, if if we win, or we, when we win, we'll give you the rematch. We'll give you the rematch. There was just a lot of confidence. And when he won by knockout, by knockout, and they started celebrating, the whole team celebrating, jumping in the ring, and you could see every face in the arena looking at you guys better calm down. I told them, guys, settle down. Let's go to the locker room and celebrate all you want in the locker room, but not here. Let's get out of here. <laughs> you want, you want but to it get... was that was that was just that was another. I mean, we weren't supposed to win, you know. And and I remember when Ricky and his team decided to fight Sajenko on on his comeback. I thought it was a mistake. It was like, wait a minute, this guy's physically bigger. Don't go off the idea just because Polly beat him and you beat Polly that Ricky could, you know, after a couple years off, can just come back and, and fight him. And I was there that night, so excited to hear back, you know, Ricky back and the fans and the and the singing and the cheering. But it was short lived when he got stopped because it was just like, oh, and this could have gone on, you know, if done right. Yeah, it was just a step too far for Ricky, wasn't it? It was a, a very hard comeback fight. It was, it was because here you had an active fighter against a fighter who had lost a lot of weight, had left a lot in the gym and the two years off, you know, the timing, the distance, a lot was off. As a matchmaker, Robert, have you ever had anything crazier than the Avery Sparrow getting arrested by the US Marshals, you know, hours before the fight? I I, I mean, that was, that was one of the craziest, but, uh, <laughs> There's there's been situations where it's like I mean fighters um, going to make weight and then fight night saying you know what I don't want to fight no more. It's like what or early in the morning it wasn't fight night it was early in the morning a heavyweight four rounder. Um, he was an opponent for one of our kids Ashanti Jordan made weight showed up and then said oh I got called at work I'm not going to be able to fight. But you already made weight what are you talking about it? He was nervous he was nervous and. Uh, he pulled out of the fight and <laughs> obviously to go to the, your, your fighter or any fighter at that and tell them you're not fighting after they weighed in after, you know, they flew in, they did all camp is always very tough, but yeah, that one. And, and Avery, you know, to no fault of his own, he, he had this, we had already checked with the marshals and the courts and everything had been done yet. They still went on. And because it wasn't in the system, the court in, uh, Philadelphia, I believe, is where he had the charge. Uh, had cleared him and said, "No problem, let him fight." We had all everything taken care of from our attorneys, but the marshal arrested him, and obviously, it was over a weekend that fight fell off. And then we rescheduled him to fight uh, James Wilkins, and unfortunately, again, Avery didn't fight because at that point, he I believe he was taken to the hospital the day of the weigh-in in the morning. Um, dehydration. He couldn't make weight. You also touched that you were a talent spotter for Golden Boy, and I believe you were also involved in the signing of Canelo. Uh, Canelo, that was Eric. Eric Gomez and uh, Chepo and Eddie had shared a relationship for many, many years, um, working with uh, Howdy and working with Chololo Larios. Um, they would always mention, hey, watch this kid when you know, when he's ready. Watch this kid. You're going to see he's very talented. I had met Canelo when he was about 15. Um, Barrera did his camp in Guadalajara for the Peden fight. 
and we actually went to Chepo and Eddie's old gym and sparred a couple times with a couple of his fighters there. And that's where I met Canelo. I believe once he did a few rounds with Barrera and I was very, very impressed because even at an early, early age, you could see the maturity in the kid and, and, and the talent. What is it when you're looking at somebody that you look for and you can tell straight away, you know, like he's got a future in the, in the game? You know, with, 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 it's all different with all fighters. I mean, obviously you look at my personal, my personal thing is obviously the most important is can he fight? Um, when they tell me I have a fighter and he's 15 and oh, and he or 10 and oh, and all by knockout, that doesn't really impress me. I, I'm like, send me a footage, send me a video. I want to see the whole thing. Don't send me highlights because don't send me sparring because that could all be altered. That could all be fixed. Hey, I, I got to send this, please. Uh, uh, sit back and take punishment you know that could all i want to see a fight i want to see when the fighter gets hit how he reacts how he responds i also like to see dedication and, and discipline and and marketability i mean it, it it's there could be especially in today's age i mean there could be so many world champions as there is maybe maybe too many world champions but there's very very few that can be superstars and that's important too to go beyond and bring new fans into boxing and and for their for their benefit as well with marketability and then sponsorships and and just the crossover stars. One of the talented fighters that you had signed was uh, Frankie Gomez. Yes, Frankie Gomez was just so comfortable inside the ring. I mean, so comfortable to do what he did to Mauricio Herrera to win every round of fighter that's given everybody out there trouble, including Danny Garcia when he went and, and beat him in Puerto Rico. I mean, Mauricio Herrera is is a veteran, fights anybody, and Frankie went in there and, and, and dominated to control. Uh, I've seen him when he was sparring Manny Pacquiao, uh, Provodnikov, Matisse, and just see how good and that's what frustrates you at times because I had several meetings with him prior and said, Frankie, remember, this is not for me. This is not for Oscar. At the end of the day, this is for you. Give me, give me five years to make a difference. And that was, you know, meetings go leading up to even before. And I remember after he beat Mauricio Herrera in the locker room, he told Freddie, I'll be back in the gym Monday. And we were all surprised because it's like, wow, you'll be back in there. He's motivated. Wow. It, it, he, he's really, you know, got this now. It, it was I haven't seen him since. Yeah, it was it was surprising because, you know, that was his biggest win to date. You know, after beating Herrera, you know, the next fight was going to be something big. And he just completely went off the radar. He would have been a, definitely a world champion. And that's what people don't understand. You know, sometimes the fans only see one side. Oh, they, they're ignoring. I think what happened with Frankie, to be honest, is he got burned out. You know, they, they got to understand, too, the fans that a lot of these fighters have been doing this, for instance, since they were 10 years old. And they don't grow, grow up having that childhood. Boxing's a very lonely sport when they're going to camps, where they're going to tournaments, when they're going sleep in, uh, don't go out it's a birthday party on the weekend. No, you can't go. It's a very lonesome, lonesome sport. It's not a team sport. So after a while they get burned out. And with Frankie, I think a lot of his look again, the talented sometimes lacks the discipline. And with Frankie, it was a lot of weight. You know, he would gain a lot of weight and going to camp with that weight gain is very, very tough because you're in camp basically to lose weight. And it's it's a tough thing, and even though once you do it, you say I'll never, this will never happen again. After camp, all you want to do is eat what you haven't eaten, go back to that pizza, the hamburgers, the hot dogs, the burritos, uh, and next thing you know, you've gained 20, 30 pounds. Talking about isolation, obviously with the coronavirus now, and you know everyone being in lockdown in quarantine, uh, has Golden Boy done anything with their fighters? to try to make sure that, you know, they don't sit at home and just eat and, you know, kind of get depressed because you can't go out. Yes. Well, we're, we're in constant contact with the guys and, and, and obviously our, our social media team is actually working with them as well right now to put out some videos and keep the fans involved and keep the fans 
motivated as well to train at home to to do something to take this time to to you know maybe recharge and 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 and, and maybe create a healthier lifestyle and yes definitely the ones that were scheduled already to fight that fights fell out like the Virgil Ortiz and and the Patrick Texteda and the Renal Varado all these champions that were scheduled on the March, Joette Gonzalez and Marlene Esparza, Lamont Roach Jr. The March and April cards, I've told them, look, just obviously don't go training like you you have a date because you don't want to hone it off a little bit. Stay in shape, stay training, stay loose, because as soon as we get the green light to go, then I'll start scheduling everybody, spread them apart. Maybe the cards aren't made the same way as they were, you know, but nobody expected what we're going through right now. But we definitely want to get everybody back once we get the green light that, you know, it's safe. Most importantly, that it's safe for them and safe for the environment, safe for the people out there to, that we can go back to our daily routine. Is there a chance that we could get kind of stack cards of big names because – Obviously, you've got to try and fit in a lot of dates and a lot of names and paydays because obviously these people are self-employed. They're not getting paid. So is it going to chance we could get a lot of big names on one single card? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, because March is out, April's out, May's possibly, you know, looking like it's going to be out. So for the fans, yes, you know, they're missing right now. But come July, August, September, we definitely want to give them some of the best boxing to make up for, you know, and make 2020 still uh, the best, the best of boxing, you know, th that we can, but yes, you can expect some very stacked cards because now in a shorter period of time, um, there's obligations that have to be met and these guys have to get back in the ring. One of the fights that I think was confirmed was a uh, can was going to go and fight Josh Warrington over in England. Is that correct? Well, he had a fight scheduled, uh, on the May 2nd possible on their card or during the May fight against Emilio Sanchez from P Pacoima. Um, we're hearing, you know, obviously there's a possibility uh, of the fight with Warrington, which would be a unification, would be a great fight, which is a fight that he's mentioned in the past he wants. We have a partner with him, uh, Lou Gang, and they're contemplating, but right now it's all on hold. Eddie has made an offer and it was agreed upon in, in terms of, you know, yes, we're, we're, we're interested. However, everything's on hold right now because we don't know, you know, when they're going to lift and, and allow us to get back in the ring with these guys and, and, and resume our, our normal activities. Any news on uh, Jojo Diaz, the rematch with Tevin Farmer? Yes. Um, they obviously Tevin Farmer and his side, uh, do want to exercise their rematch clause. However, Jojo did receive a nasty cut and he was under doctor's care. And I believe as soon as he gets clearance, we're going to try to proceed. Now, obviously the IBF has to give us the okay because there's a mandatory, but until he's cleared from the doctor and we know as early as that, you know, he can go back in then we'll proceed to talk to the IBF to to make an exception and see if he can fight his rematch and then, you know, move on to fight the mandatory after Tevin Farmer. Will that hopefully be in Southern California on my doorstep? Absolutely, it should be. <laughs> it should be. Uh, another one, Ryan Garcia against Linares was supposed to be scheduled for LA. Is that still going ahead? Well, it, it just all depends right now on, on this current situation. Jorge is back in Japan uh, training. I don't know how it's going to be as far as travel and how soon it'll be lifted, but I, I understand right now borders are closed for entry. Um, so I don't know how that's going to work right now, but that is the goal. Ryan has said it since last year. You know, he wanted, he, he, he mentioned a few names. He said, I want to fight... Uh, Duno, I want to fight Linares, and then I want to fight, I, th I think he had mentioned Campbell or, or, or Gervonta. So, you know, obviously, it, it, I'm glad you mentioned Ryan. Ryan is one of those kids that doesn't get the credit he deserves because uh, the amount of followers he has, and, you know, they're always saying, oh, he hasn't fought nobody, he hasn't. They got to remember how young he is and where he is 
in his career compared to even world champions. He's more known and he's done more. He's fought more names than some of these world champions that have won their titles and all credit to them for winning. But it's all in due time. And, and he's doing what he's supposed to, whether the fans want to give credit that, oh, he hasn't fought anybody. Okay, Fonseca. Fonseca had gone the distance with Tevin and had gone a very competitive fight with Gervonta. And, and Ryan knocked him out in one. Duno, as easy as he made it look, Duno's no joke. I, I guarantee you once Duno comes back and fights another lightweight, people will then give Ryan his respect because the kid works very hard, very hard. And, I mean, he's always in shape. He's never – again, there's where the talent, but alongside the discipline, sky's the limit. Ryan has the discipline. And now in same camp – training by Eddie Reynoso and he's learning from Canelo the maturity when you see, when fighters young fighters see a fighter that already made it a fighter that's the face of boxing yet as disciplined as Canelo is that could only motivate him to say wow this guy already made it yet he still works this hard then I have to work this hard too because I haven't made it you touched on obviously Ryan is still kind of learning the game inside out would you match him that hard against Giovante and even Devin Haney, because I see on social media they've been going back and forth. So would you match him against those already? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to remember that a lot of these great fighters in the past, it has been done. It has been done. I mean, Benitez won the world title at 17. Maybe that was way too early. But Ryan is now, you know, a couple years ago, I remember talking to Ryan and say, be patient. Be patient. It's a process. You you still haven't, your body still hasn't caught up to you. You know, the, the manhood hasn't kicked in. Wait till you're 22, Ryan. Once that body set, if you see Ryan from last year to recently, his body's changing. He's turning into the man. There's more power. The speed's always going to be there, but the power needs to develop little by little and, it, and it's getting there. And most importantly, obviously he's disciplined. He trains. But most importantly, is self-confidence. Ryan believes. He believes in himself and in his level and his talent. Goes in there and fights the best, which is what we're missing today. If Ryan loses, if he loses, he's still young. He's going to learn and he's going to move on and become better. But if he doesn't take this chance right now and he doesn't go after the big names, They'll always say, oh, he doesn't fight nobody. He doesn't fight. He knows what he wants. He knows he wants to be not just a world champion. He wants to be win world titles in different divisions. And this is where it starts. Uh, obviously, he, he knows Haney um, from the amateurs. That would be a tremendous fight. That would be Oscar and Mayweather all over again. Or, or, or Davis, you know, putting uh, Golden Boy against Mayweather promotions. That would be tremendous. That would be awesome. And and the sport wins. The, the Devin Haney fight is obviously, you know, that's Matchroom and Golden Boy. You're both under the same banner in the zone. So that would be a, an easier fight than maybe the Javante to make? It would probably be easier to make, absolutely, because obviously we've we've worked many, many fights with Matchroom, a uh, tremendous relationship with Eddie Hearn, and we've done so many fights and we'll continue to do fights. <laughs> and yes, definitely. I, I know he's... Um, rehabbing a shoulder injury a surgery from recently so look he's made it very clear ryan's made it very clear uh if the Lesnaris fight happens and he wins that one and moves on by the end of the year he wants one of these big fights whether it's davis or haney he wants one of these fights and he wants to fight for the world title and he wants to fight the best another one of the golden boy prospects one of my favorites is the uh, virgil ortiz Will we see him come back with the same fight against Vargas or will there be a different opponent? Yes, right now, I, I, both teams are, you know, uh, staying fit, staying ready, waiting for that phone call. Um, and yes, tremendous, tremendous kid. He just recently celebrated his birthday. Uh, again, very disciplined. Very, I mean, the kid is where he is right now because of hard work. Another kid like Frankie Gomez reminds me a lot of Frankie in the sense that he was, you know, very quiet, but inside the ring, an animal. I saw him spar uh, 
Lucas Matisse. I saw videos of him and Lucas, and it was like, no way. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is a few years ago when he, he was a baby. And, and, I mean, Virgil is the real deal. Virgil's, I mean, 15 fights, 50 knockouts. But not just that. Anybody can build a record. It's who he's fighting. I mean, two former world champions already. You know, uh, in, in Mauricio Herrera and also Salgado, who knocked out Linares. And then also Orozco, who had never been stopped and had gone the distance with Ramirez. So here's a kid that not just a big puncher. He, I mean, his, his boxing is, you know, his skill levels is at a different level. He's also in a very, very hard division, obviously, isn't he, with the welterweights? He's got some big names, some big fights in his future. Absolutely. That's a great division. It's always been one of my favorites. I mean, from back in, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, Benitez, Duran, Palomino. I mean, you name it, that division's always been hot. And I think if everybody can just say, put aside the differences and, and say, look, just let's make fights. That's what the fans want to see. They don't care about uh, how many views you had, how many wins you have. They just want to see the best against the best. And and that will show that boxing is not only alive, but better than ever. If everybody's willing to just put their best against their best. And we have, I mean, we, we shown in the past, we'll work with all promoters. We're Don King, top rank match room, uh, we've done fights with with every promoter out there, but you know some just want to continue doing their own fights. Moving on to the biggest name in the spot at the minute, Canelo. Uh, Canelo was scheduled to fight Billy Joe Saunders. Um, is that going to get moved due to the coronavirus, or could that be completely scrapped with the news? Obviously, Billy Joe Saunders has been. Well, back. it all depends. It all depends. Uh, you know how soon um, the states allow everybody to go back and, 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 and for this, you know, the health of everybody that everything's back to normal. And also I just, you know, read this morning about a suspension, possible suspension or, or uh, to see how long that's going to be. But, you know, it just all depends. Yes. The fight was uh, already made for, for May 2nd, but obviously due to the coronavirus, it, it's on hold now. And the triple G three, was that confirmed? I heard, a lot of newspapers and, you know, boxing websites were confirming that, but I don't think it was ever confirmed by Golden Boy. That's a possibility. But as, as always, I mean, um, first things first, if the Billy Joe Saunders fight happens, you know, obviously, and, and Canelo's one firm believer of that, it's don't we want to talk about what's after because number one, you know, respect to the fighter up front and number two, Billy Joe's no no easy picking. I mean, it's going to be a difficult fight. There's there's fights, you know, it's all based on styles and that's a difficult fight. I think I'm right in saying if he's banned by the British Board of Boxing, that's still he'll still be okay to get a license in Nevada. Is that correct? What's that? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, Michael. If he's banned by the British Board of Boxing because of the video, he still should be able to get a license to fight in Nevada. Is that right? I I don't know because, for instance, here in the states, when you're suspended uh, for whatever reason due to a, a loss, a cut, an injury, uh, banned substance, what have you, um, that should apply worldwide. Now I say should because you see fighters that could later fight in some countries and they won't um, they won't administer that suspension but it should be and then what i've seen them do in the states is if you fought while under suspension well then that ex suspension extends so i don't know if knowing nevada i think they would say if you're banned over there you're suspended over there we're going to treat it as a suspension uh like it was with one of the other states here in the u.s especially with with the british board of boxing that is very um much in communication when it comes to, you know, their fighters fight in the U S you always see a representative, uh, Robert Smith or somebody else out here and, and working with the commission. So I think I would think they would, rep you know, they would respect that, but look at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be their decision and, and, and what they, you know, and hear from Billy Joe and his side and, and we'll see what happens. And before we let you go, Roberto, uh, can you give us some of your favorite fights to watch during the lockdown? 
Oh, there's so many. There's so many. But I mean, I just earlier uh, this week, I was watching Bobby Chacon and Bazooka Limon for uh, back in the day when they were 15 rounds. I mean, that that's just there was no feel out from round one. Um, they went at it. And I mean, if if for the younger fans that never saw that era, watch anything of the 80s. Watch the Matthew Sad Muhammad fights. Watch Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Benitez documentaries. I, I watched one of Wilfredo Gomez. I was never a fan of Gomez uh, growing up as a kid. Uh, didn't like him because, you know, obviously uh, he was knocking out a lot of the Mexican fighters, <laughs> Sarate Pintor. And, you know, eventually when he fought Sanchez, it was one of the best nights I remember. But watch, I watched a document the other day on him and, it just gave me a total different um, thoughts about him and, and, and admiration for him because I knew him growing up as a big puncher. But watching him now, I realized, wow, he was a slick boxer. They sent him when he was young to Panama to learn the school of boxing of Panama, which is using a lot of leg and, and in and out. And he learned how to slip punch it. And I didn't know that about him. Obviously, when you see his record, of 32 knockouts and, and all the title defenses all by knockout, you only think, oh, he's a puncher. He's a puncher and puncher. But when you see him actually in those early fights in his prime and how he slipped punches, it's like, wow, this guy was great. I mean, not only a puncher, but a tremendous boxer. Nazim Hamed, I didn't like him. I didn't like him. And today, as a matchmaker, he's a promoter's dream. <laughs> <laughs> you miss a Nassim Hamed because he was a showman. He could knock you out. He could sell a fight. Whether you loved him or hated him, you wanted to go see him. You pay a ticket to watch him, and he would fill up arenas. He, we miss Hamed today. We miss those type of fighters. You know, Pais, many people thought Pies was, you know, the clown. <laughs> no pun said he was a clown. He came from a circus, <laughs> but he could punch and take a punch and. There, there are just so many fights out there that it's just, you know, right now is the time. That, and that's what I've been doing. I've been watching old fights um, and seeing what what I can take back to some of these young fighters to say, hey, watch this fight. You you fight similar to, to this fighter. Watch some of his fights. Pick up something there. Eric Morales, during my time with Barrera, was that rivalry was so real. Yet today you got to love Eric Morales as one of the best fighters ever. I mean, he wasn't just a, a brawler. He was a technician, which he brawled with Barrera because it was, they, their hatred was so much, but if he was a tremendous boxer with feints and everything. So yeah, the, the time, the last couple of weeks, I've been watching a lot of YouTube and a, a lot of Netflix. <laughs> the same. That's all I've been doing is, it's kind of good to go back to watch some of the fighters like you touched on because you realize, you know, how much skill they actually had. It's like watching, you know, like poetry in motion in some of the old time fighters. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, right now it's, it is a tough time. It's un, unfamiliar territory. We're not used to it. We, we, for most of us, we've never lived through something like this, but taking all that's going on and finding a positive, it's also our chance to at home catch up. You know, sometimes we're working too hard. We 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 forget the 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 real important things, and and you know, health, family, and and just unwinding. I think personally, I'm at the healthiest part time right now because because there's no boxing, there's been no stress for the last two weeks in that sense of fights falling, fighters getting injured, not going through their medicals, not making the weight. That stress has been gone for at least a few weeks and I've been in, eating healthy. There's not much else to do. So I go out to the, the garage, work out, run every morning. And I'm like, Oh wow. You know what? I, I can get used to this life again, <laughs> but I want to get back to boxing. No doubt. Yeah. We all, we all seem to miss it. Um, I just want to thank you again, Roberto, for your time today. Uh, the floor is yours. If you want to plug anything for golden boy, your social media accounts, it's not, the floor is yours. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Uh, I want to send all my best. Everybody stay in. That's the only way we're going to knock this out. Stay in, stay safe, social distance. And I, I invite the fans, you know, to send out messages of fights they like to see. I mean, at times it's not just in our hands. You know, there's trainers, managers, or, or certain obstacles that we have to get through. But 
I definitely will consider them. And, 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 you know, obviously at the end of the day, we work for the fans. We will try to make this for the fans and get the best fights out there. Um, they can reach me at Michel all the time on Instagram and, and Twitter and obviously DM me or anything. And, you know, we'll take it from there. Thanks again, Roberto. Really enjoyed it. And obviously we'd love to have you on again in the future. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Anytime. Thanks, Michael. Stay safe. And you. Thank you. Take care, Bob. Bye. Thanks again to uh, Roberto Diaz, the VP and matchmaker for Golden Boy Promotions. Uh, Join us again next week for episode 74. We'll try and get some content to get you through this hard time in the quarantine. Don't forget to follow us at The Last Round 12 on Twitter and Instagram. And you can also find us now on Boxing Social's YouTube page. Every week, all of our content will be placed up there. And once again, this is The Last Round. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.